in Kaddish, you mourn for your mother. Yeah. Tell me about her. Well, my mother was a refugee from Russia in 1905. When she was about eight years old, she came to America and had nervous breakdowns almost immediately. Married my father, who was born here of Russian parents. And then in the 30s, I remember visiting her in Sanitaria, where um, they had the cricket played on the lawn. <laughs> uh, not cricket, but the little mallets and balls going croquet. through hoops. Yeah, croquet. Yeah. And um, uh, as I grew up, I had to take care of her on and off, as my father was teaching in college. So when I was 9, 10, 12, 13, I visited her by myself in mental hospitals, which were grimy, huge, uh, drab prisons in those days where she'd uh, had shock treatment, insulin and metrosol and lobotomy and electro electroshock. You actually signed the forms for her lobotomy, yes, is I that right? Told, I was told later, when I was then 26 or so, yeah. that the doctors told me that she was in a state of such paroxysm and, uh, and high blood pressure and anguish banging her head literally against the wall, bloody, that if I didn't, uh, they didn't take action, for which I'd had to sign, she might have a stroke. And rather naively believing what they had to say, I signed. So I've always felt enormous guilt and, uh, but, you know, uncertainty about it. What was the effect on you on living uh, with a mother who was mad? Well, it gave me a great sort of tolerance for eccentric behavior. <laughs> Certainly, and uh, a kind of understanding of uh, the varieties of suffering that people can go through, a variety of suffering she went through. I mean, she was called mad, but you know, there were physiological concomitants, like she had a thing called hyperesthesia, where any sound, at, at one point, I remember, she lay in a darkened room, and any sound, any noise was painful physically. You know, like too much uh, 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 stimulation actually had some effect on raw nerves, maybe some, I've heard of it since, as there is synesthesia or cryptesthesia or dysesthesia, which I have, which is feeling lack in the foot soles because of uh, diabetes. So uh, I actually had to take care of her and had to deal with her irrationality and sort of as a kid, not knowing whether it was irrational or real, but having to negotiate it diplomatically. So it gave me a kind of, uh, well, I would say a, an armoring. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, to uh, get too pained. On the other hand, the, the, uh, the lack of love or the need for a strong motherly affection remained intact in the heart, I think and never does disappear. So there's always this longing for, for uh, uh, feminine uh, bliss, and at the same time, fear of it. And yeah. so I'm gay, in a sense. In her uh, sane episodes, she was a woman of very strong political opinions. She yes, she, she claimed to be the uh, secretary of the Patterson, New Jersey Communist Party cell. So, uh, and Patterson was like a big red town, but the great strikes with John Reed in 1918 or so. And has a great labor history, actually. Uh, one interesting thing is that J. Edgar Hoover, who was a closet queen, destroyed the labor unions in America because they were originally formed by left-wing pinkos with political ambition, you know, to form a left in America. And in the destruction of the, of the labor unions, uh, uh, the protected mafia, mafia protected by the FBI, of which Hoover was the head, uh, moved into the vacuum when they uh, uh, purged all the unions of left-wing organizers that had started the unions. And that's why we have no labor or socialist party in America, where we have no left in America. We have the middle and the right now. You also spent some time in your life in mental hospitals. Yes, 1948, I think. Uh, well, it had a, something like a visionary experience or a hallucinatory experience of hearing William Blake's voice reading The Sunflower and The Sick Rose and The Little Girl Lost. And uh, something opened up in, uh, in space for me. I don't know what it was, maybe ordinary mind. Um, but I suddenly realized the endlessness of the skies and the exquisite work uh, in the building sides and cornices of New York apartment houses. That 
hundred, maybe fifty years ago, Italian workmen had labored with intelligence to make all the scroll work and copper work on the on this, uh, the roof combs. And um, uh, then, the, so that kind of confused me as what I had seen, and I had no terms to think of it except Christian terms or Jewish terms, but monotheistic terms. I hadn't had any experience with the empty mind idea or satori idea of Buddhism. And so I was quite confused about what was real and what was unreal. As, as uh, Bob Dylan says, the princess and the prince discuss what's real and what is not. <laughs> so the, I wound up uh, with a group of uh, friends who were uh, robbers and um, got busted with them and it was a question of going to jail or going to the madhouse as polite students do these days. Tell me about the Blake experience because <clears throat> that was a big thing. What happened? Well, I just tried, tried to give you a thumbnail sketch, but I, I don't know. It's sort of like an albatross. It, like a, uh, it was an ancient mariner and he stopped <laughs> with one of three by that long gray beard and my glittering eye. Wherefore, stops thou me, BBC. Uh, it was a, a situation in which I was alone. Uh, I had had a love affair with Neil Cassidy, and he had gone off and gotten married, and I thought abandoned me. Burroughs, who was a close friend already for many years, was in, in New Orleans, and Kerouac had withdrawn to his house. And I was living in Harlem, East Harlem, New York, on the sixth floor of a tenement, with a lot of theological books around, uh, that I, in an apartment I rented from a theology student friend. So I was reading a lot of Plato's Phaedrus, St. John of the Cross, and other books, and Blake. And I had the sudden, I'm reading The Sick Rose and The Sunflower. I had uh, the odd sensation of uh, hearing Blake's voice outside of my own body. A voice really not too much unlike my own when my voice is centered in my sternum. Uh, maybe a latent projection of my own uh, physiology. But in any case, a surprise and apparently, maybe a hallucination, you could call it, hearing it in the room, Blake reciting, or some very ancient voice of the ancient of days, reciting, ah, sunflower, weary of time, who countest the steps of the sun, seeking after that sweet, golden climb where the traveler's journey is done, where the youth pined away with desire, and the pale virgin shrouded in snow arise from their graves, and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go. So there was some earthen deep quality that moved me, and then I looked out the window and it seemed like the uh, the heavens were endless, or the sky was endless, I should say. Did that help you become a poet? Well, it was a very turning around uh, experience. It was a very definitive experience, yeah. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, and I wouldn't assert it as a vision. I would say a hallucination, that's fine. But it certainly left an imprint on my nature. You used drugs thereafter to try to recapture that hallucination, well, hallucinatory I used, experience? I had or? used drugs before, but in that yeah. period, that year, I wasn't. And drugs, but not drugs, dried herbs, uh, marijuana, that's all. And um, I had, uh, uh, years later, I tried uh, psychedelics, three, four years later, tried peyote to see if I could approximate the experience. And I think the, uh, the psychedelic drugs do approximate some natural experience, but they aren't as ample, as ample, uh, as grounded as a natural experience, if you can call my own Blake experience natural. Uh, I, at the time, actually, I was uh, eating vegetables, I wasn't eating meat, and I was eating a solitary life, and sort of a beat in the sense of uh, uh, something I've heard recently from a folk singer, uh, um, freedom's just another word for nothing more to lose. <laughs> uh, so uh, my heart was open, in a sense, at the time. Is the value of such an experience, which you must have sought over and over again with the different drugs that you mm -hmm. used, is it a the, the experience worthwhile in itself, or does it permanently help you to perceive an expanded universe? Well, I think um, a natural experience permanently helps you to 
key, have a key to the fact that the universe is, in ordinary mind even, endless, <laughs> uh, beyond the uh, horizon. So, but, so it might wake you to that, that ordinary mind, as Zen people call it. The um, psychedelic experience, whether it's peyote or LSD or uh, um, psilocybin uh, or natural mushrooms or as an extension of diet, might catalyze this very similar sense of infinity or expansiveness or panoramic awareness, you could call it, which you find in Wordsworth's sonnet on West Winston, Westminster Bridge or his moment on top when he steps out of the mists. I don't in think Wordsworth Freddy. ever took. No, no, right. but his friends did remember. Yeah. <laughs> the sure. pneumatic institute, sure. the uh, laughing gas. Sir so yeah. Humphrey Davy and the Lake Poets were very interested in that. <laughs> Uh, so he was familiar and also familiar with Coleridge's uh, experiments with laudanum. But uh, the natural experience of expansive panoramic awareness can be catalyzed by the psychedelic drugs, and I think they're quite useful. Uh, I would recommend, however, people learn some uh, meditative centering, uh, sitting practice of meditation, in order to ground themselves so that they're not uh, entangled in their own projections, in their imagination. Not, not confused by the re reality or unreality of what they think they see. What does meditation do for you? Well, it develops patience. I mean, if you sit, if to sit there like this, following your breath, and um, noticing when your mind wanders, you get a profile both of your mind and some sense of the space around you, which might lead to that sense of panoramic awareness. Do you, do, that, not, do you do that today? Yes, I do it every day, and I've done it since 1970 or so, and before that also. How long for it each day? Well, there, was, there were some periods when I did it an hour or two hours a day, or some periods when I went on retreats and did it eight hours a day for weeks at a time. Now it's fragments and snatches of time, but mixed with other forms of meditation, Vajrayana-style Tibetan Buddhists, which involve visualization and mantra. But um, I had long experience of just sitting, uh, as it's called, just sitting. Shikantaza in uh, Zen terms, or just uh, shamatha, that's the Sanskrit for quietening the mind, leading to vipassana, which is uh, uh, s clear seeing. In other words, if you let the water settle and the dust settle to the bottom of the fish bowl, and you can see through the fish bowl. <laughs>